You're listening to You First, the Disability Rights Florida podcast. In this episode, we talk with AJ Link, Jalen Radzeminski, and Haley Moss about neurodiversity in the legal field. Hey everyone, I'm Keith. And I'm Maddie, and we're the hosts of You First. We have an awesome episode in store for you today. We talk with AJ, Jalen, and Haley about honestly so So much. much. (laughs) But the main thread through this whole conversation is their experience as neurodivergent people or people with disabilities who are either actively going to law school or have gone to law school. Yeah, yeah. So here's a little background. At e- at really, a little background. There's a lot of background. So get comfy. <laughs> we have some really qualified folks here, and we want to tell you all about their qualifications. So mm-hmm. uh, here we go. First up is AJ Link is openly autistic. He received his Juris Doctorate from the George Washington University Law School and his LLM in space law at the University of Mississippi School of Law, which, by the way, I learned also what LLM means, which is a Master of Laws. So I'd never known that before. So right yeah. off the bat, you're learning something, right? Mm-hmm. I also didn't know space law was a thing. So I didn't I, either. It's just the beginning of a very yeah. good conversation. Space law sounds like a series from like the 70s or something. Tune in yeah. for space law. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> he is the inaugural director of the Center for Air and Space Law Task Force on Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity in Aerospace and an adjunct professor of space law at Howard University School of Law. Also impressive. I just, I, it just every time I say space, I'm just like, this is awesome. Yeah. AJ also works as a research director for the Just Add Astra project and previously served as the communication director for Astro Access. He is the space law and policy chair for Black in Astro and was the founding president of the National Disabled Law Students Association. He also helped found the National Disabled Legal Professionals Association and is a commissioner on the American Bar Association Commission on Disability Rights. AJ is a policy analyst for the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. He has been actively involved with disability advocacy in the Washington, D.C. area and nationally within the United States. Next. Literally (laughs) just like one of the coolest freaking people in the world. Amazing. (laughs) I love him. He's great. Yeah. All right, next up we have Jalen. Jalen Radzimiski is a black and Japanese activist from Fort Wayne, Indiana, who advocates for disability and racial justice, especially in the intersection of mental health. Jalen is dedicated to breaking down barriers for BIPOC disabilities, including voting and civic engagement, and to lifting up community based and anti carceral solutions. Jalen's work is informed by their lived experience as a student and a young professional with mental and physical disabilities, navigating voter suppression, and over eight years of experience doing advocacy at the intersection of race, mental health, and mass incarceration. Jalen is the founder of Count Us In, the first Indiana based nonpartisan nonprofit led by BIPOC and disability nice. community members, which is so cool. Oh, yeah. They were part of the Access the Vote event that we recently just oh, right. yeah. supported. Yeah. Yeah, so cool. Um, but the Countison organization not only increases, but intentionally diversifies voter turnout and broader civic engagement through education and empowerment of the community members. Radzeminski is also an elected commissioner and vice chair for Indiana Disability Rights Protection and Advocacy Services. Hey, hey, (laughs) (laughs) but last but certainly not least, Mm -hmm. at the national level, Jalen has served as the director of engagement for the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law, through which they help lead community coalitions, call to action campaigns and grassroots organizing. Internationally, Jalen has studied and worked in Japan, Germany and the Netherlands to advocate and learn about human rights. Jalen graduated from Emory and is pursuing their JD as an evening student at Fordham University School of Law. And most recently, Jalen was named the 2023 Public Interest Student of the Year and Crowley Scholar in International Human Rights at Fordham Law. Jalen has also spoken at the White House several times regarding issues surrounding disability, voting, racial justice, and mass incarceration. 
Wow. Literally like legend. Oh, like when, doing the damn thing. When did these people have time to be on our podcast? I uh, no, <laughs> no, literally. It's incredible. Well, one more, last but not certainly not least, we yeah. have Haley Moss. Haley Moss is a lawyer, neurodiversity expert, and the author of four books that guide neurodivergent individuals through professional and personal challenges. She's a consultant at top corporations and nonprofits who seek out her guidance in creating a diverse workplace. Haley is a sought after commentator on disability rights issues, who is best known also as Florida's first openly autistic attorney. Her Ooh. latest books, yes, indeed. Her latest books include Great Minds Think Differently, Neurodiversity for Lawyers and Other Professionals, and The Young Autistic Adults Independence Handbook. Haley's articles have appeared in media outlets such as The Washington Post, Teen Vogue, and Fast Company. And I think she was also just recently voted top 30 under uh, 30 in Forbes for uh, the Miami region. Congratulations on that one. Another legend. Indeed. On the pod. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. As y'all can tell, these folks are literally like international leaders on disability, law, intersectionality, all of these topics that we're going to get into. And we had such a good time talking with them mm -hmm. about their experiences. I personally learned so much mm -hmm. from them. Oh, um, and you will all love this conversation. So let's get into it. Here is AJ, Jalen and Haley. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being on the You First podcast today. I am so incredibly excited to be talking with you all. If you would take a moment to introduce yourself, provide a visual description, pronouns, etc., as you're interested, just tell us like a little bit about you and how you came to where we are today. This is AJ. I'm a black dude with a beard. I'm finally getting a lot of gray, so that's cool. I've got on a black hat with pink accent. It shows the Seattle Mariners logo. And I've got on a black shirt and a gold necklace with Norma on it. That is my wife. And then there is a gallery behind me. One of the things is a sticker chart. It's one of the first things me and my wife did when we met each other was have a sticker chart to see who was better at doing things. And <laughs> I've been doing disability advocacy for a while now. I actually have known Haley and Jalen for a while now. I got into doing self-advocacy stuff in law school. I helped found a few organizations and yeah, I'm just really excited to be here and talk disability with some of my favorite homies. I can go next. Hi everyone. This is Jalen Radzminski. They them pronouns. I'm a black and Asian person with light skin and I now have short curly hair. A little tired of looking today because school is a lot. <laughs> I'm a law student and I'm wearing a cozy sweater to stay comfy as I study and a long sleeve green shirt. And I'm just standing or sitting in front of a, a window and white wall background. And again, I'm Jalen and I'm currently a law student at Fordham Law. I'm a second year evening student, which means that I work during the day and I go to school at night. And so I've worked at the Basel Center for Mental Health Law for the past three years as the director of engagement, really just making sure peers in the disability community's voices are heard in law and policy and just organizing as well in campaigns. And I'm the founder of Count Us In, also known as Count Us Indiana, where I it is the only, not only in Indiana, but in the U.S. BIPOC femme disability led organization that. Um, focuses on not only increasing voter turnout and civic engagement, but also diversifying it to ensure that our voices are centered and heard. Um, you'll probably hear a lot more about me, but all of my work really intersects with human rights, disability justice, racial justice, um, and abolition type of work and civic engagement. But that's me in a nutshell, and I'm just eager for the conversation today. I guess that means I am the last of our panelists to introduce myself. This is Haley Moss. I am a white woman with red hair. I have bangs. I am wearing a black t-shirt and I am in my dad's office and he has all sorts of cool hats and a traffic light and some guitars behind me as well. I am an attorney, an author, an artist, and I enjoy advocating and educating about neurodiversity, autism, and all that stuff. So if you didn't know, I'm very proudly autistic. And I'm just excited for the conversation to have with everybody here. 
and to see how we can continue to amplify, uplift, and make a bigger impact together. I am also on the board of Disability Rights Florida and making sure that the voice of disabled folks is represented there whenever I can is something I take to heart. So it's really great to get to represent all sorts of different aspects of who I am while being here. So looking forward to a great conversation. Yeah, it's so great to meet all of you. I'm really looking forward to this wonderful conversation as well. And it's a real honor to have you all here on the podcast. So, yeah, the topic today is neurodiversity, neurodivergence. There's many ways you can say it. There's many things it means, right? And it sort of means something different to everybody. Maybe let's just go around and each talk about what to you is neurodiversity and how do you connect and identify with it? This is Jalen. I could speak first on that. So just generally, I entered the community through like disability justice lens. So I, you'll often hear me refer to myself as disabled, but I, I do understand like neurodiversity. It's really just challenge, at least to me, it's challenging the concept of neurodivergent and neurotypical. And it challenges the misconception that there's a dichotomy in that. And so for me, I, I identify with neurodiverse community more so like I, by identifying as disabled just because that is the way that I found the movement. And for me personally, have always had disabilities, but I also developed some over time. And I don't quite, I know a lot of times people talk about not neurodiversity through like medical type of labels like ADHD, bipolar, dyslexia. I don't quite subscribe to using those titles for myself. However, I, I was giving medical labels in college. So I guess there's that. And but I also understand people like myself usually don't get access to different support systems like accommodations until late like college or they don't at all. And yeah, again, like I don't subscribe to those systems, but like I've encountered them and that's how I've entered the community with that in addition to just the disability justice space. And I guess just for me and how I operate by saying disabled, I just process information differently and at different speeds. A lot of times people ask me, how do you do all this stuff? Honestly, some days my brain goes a thousand miles an hour and I can make all these cool concepts and ideas and activism events in another day. It's just, nope, I'm tired now. So it shuts off. So that's just how I connect with the community, uh, an example of the way it manifests in my life and just acknowledging that disability and neurodiversity has like an intersection there and everyone kind of enters the community in different ways. This is Haley, and I think that's a great point about how everybody gets to this community in a different way. I feel very privileged that I was identified as autistic as a child, primarily because I was a late speaker. And in the 90s, that is enough to be cause for concern for my family and other families as well. So I very much recognize that privilege of that this is something I've known about myself, but I never really intended as a younger person to get involved in the community. The way that I had learned about neurodivergence and autism in particular for me was this is something that you can share with people when you feel ready or that it's necessary in order to get support and accommodations. But I actually fell into autistic and later more broadly disability and neurodiverse advocacy. As a teenager, I was invited by some of the folks that had originally identified me and worked with my family to speak at a conference. I was maybe 13. They wanted a young person's perspective and particularly this perspective of a young girl, and I was happy to do it. It was an excuse to go to Orlando. It was an excuse to go to Disney World. And it changed my perspective greatly because it was the first time I had connected with autistic college students, with adults, and I got to recognize what might be possible. And of course, my views on neurodiversity and autism and whatnot have changed from being in community for so long. And it's something that's very interesting for me having to reckon with the things that I thought as a teenager are not things that I believe as I am approaching 30 years old. And that is something that comes with time, experience, and meeting people who have very different life experiences than you do, which is also why I am glad that this community is so intersectional and it really is something that we can approach from so many different lenses. But when I talk about neurodiversity more broadly, I always say that this is something that encompasses all of us, not just whether or not you are disabled or non-disabled. It's not that simple because every single one of us has a unique brain. We're not robots. We're not computers. And the way that we experience the world from processing information to sensory experiences to all these things is very different and wholly unique. 
a lot of the times whenever I, I talk about how our brains are processing information, I talk about when we're all in the same room and there are people in that room who will always think it's very cold. And there are always people who will think it's very warm, no matter what the temperature or the thermostat says. And none of those people are right or wrong because that is exactly what their body and their brain is telling them is going on in that room. And you're just adapting based on the information you're receiving. Yes, there are people who are neurodivergent and fall under these different labels and things like that. And also people, if your brain works outside of what we consider to be the traditions and societal expectations, you're probably neurodivergent is what I tell people since it's not meant to be a gatekeeping term or definition. So that's a little bit about my feelings on it and how I came to this. Hey, this is AJ and I think Haley and Jalen have both provided really good examples of how I guess complicated the relationship can be. I would describe my relationship with the neurodiversity movement as complicated. I think to Haley's point, neurodiversity is everyone. I think sometimes the language gets thrown around like neurodiversity means that you are not neurotypical. Uh, and similar to Jalen, I come at it from a perspective of disability justice and identifying as autistic and disabled. And for me, it's really frustrating seeing how people have latched on to neurodiversity as a phrase that's almost been used as a substitute for talking about disability. I know that not every neurodivergent person identifies as disabled, which is a whole other complicating factor, right? A lot of people who maybe fall under the, the neurodivergent umbrella for whatever reason or self-identify that way oftentimes push back against being identified as disabled and they use being neurodivergent and the neurodiversity movement to separate themselves out from other disabled folks, which again is really complicated. And so for me, it's always difficult as someone who gets almost siloed into to doing neurodiversity talks. And hey, I'm sure both Haley and Jalen both experienced this, being the the neurodivergent person on the neurodiversity panel when they want to talk just about neurodiversity and neurodivergence, but I'm sitting there wanting to talk about disability justice as a whole, right? Because it's all interconnected and our collective access and collective liberation is all bundled together. So for me, I really appreciate the neurodiversity movement. I appreciate all the advocates that are making sure that neurodivergent inclusion is a thing, especially for folks who have mental disabilities, cognitive disabilities, intellectual and developmental disabilities, all the kinds of brain disabilities, I guess. Yeah, I still just have really complicated feelings about how a lot of people, both outside and inside the movement, are, are using neurodiversity as a way to, to separate out other disabled folks and people in the disabled community and not have to do the work of really inclusive disability justice. This is Maddie, and I really appreciate y'all kind of sharing your perspectives here. And I was curious if we could take a pause and ask y'all to speak a little bit more to that, because I think as y'all laid out, like, when you're talking about neurodiversity, it's not necessarily, like you said, AJ, people that just identify with having autism or ADHD or whatever it may be. It's the fact that everybody has a different mind and way of processing things. And I'm curious if y'all could speak a little bit to what you're talking about as far as like how there is some separation or between the neurodiversity movement or disability justice, et cetera, and how those, I don't know, I feel like the disability community has like this tendency of, of like, and, and beyond the disability community of like creating these categories of who fits into what circle of identity. And I think broader disability justice accepts everybody into that community and into that movement towards disability justice. So I'm curious if y'all could take a moment to further explain what you mean through through talking about this. This is Haley. I'm happy to chat a little bit about this complicated relationship and even touching on something that AJ mentioned about how a lot of neurodivergent people might not also identify as disabled in the way that we silo those communities. Like you were saying, Maddie, I think that's really interesting. I think there's two major things at play here. I think there is what happens with well-meaning 
allies who do the work in things like neurodiversity and employment. And I also think there's a whole silo of internalized ableism that neurodivergent people experience as to why they feel uncomfortable perhaps identifying with disability or why that people fall into what is sometimes known as neurodiversity light or why the disability community and the neurodiversity community might be sometimes very separated. So I get to do a lot of corporate education and something that comes up a lot is the way that neurodiversity and neurodivergence is talked about as it's always reduced simply to autistic people with less support needs or that are perceived as having fewer needs, ADHD and learning disabilities because they are the ones that are viewed as desirable in some way because they have superpowers or because they are going to be super productive. They're going to be hyper-focused on everything. They're going to be inherently loyal to the company and whatnot as we're touting all these benefits that sometimes forget and ignore the humanity of neurodivergent people. And I say every time, if you're just going for the super productive, super loyal person, you're forgetting this person has feelings, and also they are human. If you expect me to be at that level of performance, I'm going to burn out. It's that simple. (laughs) Just like any other person, if you're expecting that level from them. And it also creates more stigma when this happens for people who have mental health disabilities, psychiatric conditions, people with intellectual disabilities who simply don't get the same opportunities Each of us on this panel has been to or is currently in law school, and that's an immense privilege of itself that's so often denied to our neurokin and other disabled folks, especially with intellectual disabilities. Even getting through things like the bar admissions process with a mental health disability, we could be here all day long talking about the different roadblocks just in that. So a lot of the times that happens with that privilege. And then there's the internalized ableism of that people, I think, especially if they do have the ability to mask or pass or anything like that, that they fall into disabled, but not really, or neurodivergent, but I can pass as neurotypical, therefore it's okay. And I say this very openly because that's something that I felt a lot of pressure to do in my life and something I used to identify very greatly with as a younger person before I met people within my community. As a young teenager, I often thought, oh, autistic, but not really, because the images of autism I had didn't sound or look or feel like me. They didn't feel like people I knew because of what my limited experience at the time was. And that was a form of internalized ableism. Oh, I can't identify with this experience. And now I know I have so much more in common with people who do have intellectual disabilities, who might also have a co-occurring seizure disorder, who might be non-speaking than I ever would have thought that I would have when I was 13 years old. And I say that very openly because Again, this is a learning process for all of us. Not all of us come to disability rights and disability justice out the door knowing everything. And it's disingenuous to say that we do. But this kind of internalized ableism thing of I'm not disabled enough or that being disabled is for people who have more needs or whatnot is something that I think is very much embedded into the community in some way. And it's also things that I think that we've learned throughout our lives from the non disabled people around us because you were somehow praised or somehow expected to assimilate at such a high level, especially if you're entering a field like law. I'm not sure if it's as coherent as I want it to be when I try to say this out loud, but I hope that it makes sense where I'm trying to go with this. But just some of my feelings on this topic while we are having this discussion. Yeah, this is AJ. I think (laughs) I'm just laughing because just a lot of the advocacy I do is like following Haley. (laughs) which is so amazing. I love being able to to ride Haley's amazing coattails. I think it's really complicated because you don't want to tell people they can't identify in a certain way or self-identify. And I think to the question about <laughs> silos and marking and having demarcations of what is and isn't disabled or what kind of disability is to to Jalen's point about diagnoses and pathologization, still remnants of a real medical model of disability, right? We don't want to erase or not acknowledge that everyone's body mind is different. That's part of neurodiversity, right? But understanding that we are not fully our medical diagnosis, the way we are pathologized into being disabled, right? This disability from an identity perspective is so much more complicated than that. And I think Haley touched on it and and Jalen touched on it when they were talking about their experience in college and higher education. 
the way you identify as disabled is deeply impacted by the way the world treats you and the way that you interact with the world. So when you talk about neurodiversity light or not disabled enough, that means that it's the world impacting how you view yourself, right? And it's really empowering, at least it was for me, to understand that I can take control of how I describe my relationship with everything else. And that for me is how I found my identity as an autistic person and as a disabled person, because that is my relationship to the world. A lot of people, because I've been to law school because I do so many different things, and Haley and Jalen have both talked about this, they don't view you as disabled. But my disability is in relationship to what happens when I'm not doing podcasts and presentations and conferences, right? And how all of that deeply impacts me when no one else is around. I joke about it a lot. And my wife <laughs> giggles when this happens, because sometimes it happens when she's around and people say, I'm not that disabled or I'm not that autistic because she's at home with me every day when <laughs> I very much am. <laughs> and she has to experience that. And so her perspective on how I navigate the world as an autistic person has been shaped by her ability to be around me more. And so when people project their connotations or stereotypes of what it means to be autistic to Haley's point, just like a supercomputer white dude, like that is them enforcing their view of disability on me. And for a lot of disabled folks, they internalize that ableism. And again, for me, it's just really empowering to realize that I can push back against that, that I can declare what my own relationship to disability is and what to autism is and what neurodivergence is. And I can own those relationships and those identities. And for me, that's been really empowering. And I think if you get really into disability justice and disability theory, that's kind of centric to it, right? Like being able to fully embody and express your wholeness as a person and your relationship to the rest of the world. Yeah, I really love, and this is Jalen speaking, I really love everything that um, AJ and Haley shared because I resonate with it a lot and it's things that I've had to navigate as well, just like the contentions of internalized ableism and masking and the fact that the like society and the media pushes down your throat some sort of prototype of what disability, what neurodiversity is supposed to look like. And because we're all individual human beings, even if people are, the medical model pushes a certain label on someone people with that same label could be experiencing the world in so many different ways. And I think for me, I think the different dichotomies that have impacted me most personally and that I often think about outside of these talks, like AJ noted, I love that point as well. It's just like the pressure, the inter internalized ableism pressure in that sort of career that I'm pursuing, like the law. I was, I did not get access to accommodations and healthcare for what I was navigating be for such a long time because as a Black Japanese person in society, I, I already was programmed to force myself to try to fit in as much as I could over time. And a lot of things were hidden. People didn't know certain things that I was experiencing and constantly having to power through to overcome. And I think that creates a lot of difficulties of just getting access to support and really, more importantly, access to the community, because I feel like finding community like this is very validating. And for me, I think another complication is like how we were explaining how we found community in different ways. At first, I sought out the mental health community, but then there, there still is a like, people try to separate mental health and those type of conditions from disability. The whole notion that Haley and AJ was explaining the concept that you could possibly not be disabled enough. It's a lot of unpacking there, I think. But also even finding disability rights, I quickly figured out people who look like me are not included in those. And so that's how I ended up landing in the disability justice community because it acknowledges Black and other Indigenous people of color. It acknowledges queerness. It, it acknowledges the impacts of immigration. So that's how I ended up navigating those complications just because there's so many barriers already for like people to find the community in general, especially if you're not a cis white person. I felt the most safe trying to pursue disability justice communities, quite honestly. And 
you in some disability spaces, you could share an experience that is very much a disability experience and some people will deny you just because of the fact that you're not a white person experiencing this. That's part of it was a lot of just seeking out community and a lot of it was just doors being shut to me. But th- those are some of the nuances I feel like that some people also have to navigate when finding disability and neurodiverse spaces. Yeah, thanks for all those really great insights and perspectives on this. I, one of the things that I kept thinking about during some of y'all's answers was, God forbid someone learns what, quote, autism is from a movie where it's portrayed, because it's never portrayed accurately. And it's and even that's one subtype. That's one very narrow possibility of what that means to be on the spectrum. So I, I just I, I was thinking about when I was younger and the movie Rain Man came out and then suddenly everybody thought, oh, is that what autism is? No, 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 it's not. That is a really awful, like single sided perspective of that. But unfortunately, that's where so many people get these perspectives from and certainly colors people's opinions in very much the wrong way and expect something from an individual who identifies as having autism in a very limited fashion. And it's yeah. So just some extra thoughts there. So let's turn attention to the fact that all three of you are either studying law, practicing law, and or have a law degree. So let's talk a little bit about your experiences. Like, what is that experience like for you as it relates to your disability or neurodiversity? And how do your identities even benefit you maybe in your profession? This is AJ. I'll go because I think I'm the only one who's never going to practice law amongst the three of us. So law school was really important for me and helping me develop into an advocate. I never wanted to be a practicing attorney. I went to law school to be an advocate and a lobbyist, which is what I do now. And for me, it was a chance to learn how to navigate hierarchy and bureaucracy and become better at doing advocacy work. And it gave me the opportunity to figure out who I want to be as an advocate. And for me, the law school experience, I came in not with that fully formed, but with the with the beginnings of that kind of outlook was really fun and amazing and cool. I tell people this all the time, especially people who talk about how stressful law school was for me. It wasn't any of those things because I didn't care about my grades. I didn't care about getting jobs or internships because I was doing other things and working on other projects. And that's super privileged and fortunate. I will acknowledge that. But it was so much fun getting to get the administration to care about disability, to start a disability focus group, to get to create a a disability nonprofit focused on disabled law students. Like all of that shit was so fun and cool for me. And I thought it was beautiful. And I really try to encourage people to understand that just like being neurodivergent doesn't mean one thing. Like attending law school doesn't mean one thing either. You don't have to be the person who's in the library for however many hours people stay in there. You know, I could probably count the number of times I went into the library on a couple fingers. Mostly I went to the library for the free scanning. Um, but I, I think for me, understanding systemic ableism from a legal perspective, understanding how the law has historically been used to harm and hurt disabled people so much more than it has been used to help disabled people. I know that we often celebrate Section 504, which is the 50th anniversary this year, Section 504, the Rehabilitation Act or the ADA amendments. Like we celebrate those things or even Olmstead and RIP to, oh man, I'm blanking on it. Louise, Louise, I can never remember her name. Jalen, please. Lo- Lois Curtis, I got you. Lois Curtis. Yeah, I was saying, I was going to say Louise Curtis, Lois Curtis. And yeah, those are all amazing. But usually the law has been used to sterilize disabled folks, to institutionalized disabled folks to murder disabled folks and learning that history really solidified that I appreciate the disability rights movement. I appreciate the tools that I have that come from the disability rights movement. I appreciate that I'm able to navigate disability rights and do that professionally, but it really solidified that I wanted to do disability justice and like disability rights work was not for me. That's not where my heart is, where my soul is, where my passion is. And so all that's to say like, my law school experience was really important in formulating that outlook on how I do my advocacy now. This is Haley. So I did go to law school. I think I was the first of the group to graduate. So my law school experience was a little bit different than AJ's because 
his organizations did not exist while I was in law school, <laughs> which I am kind of upset about because when we wanted to have disability anything, it was shot down. And I didn't know many disabled or neurodivergent students when I was in law school that immediately there was this kind of navigating the system that felt very daunting. I remember my first year of law school, there was a blind student in my section. And everyone was always in a bad mood about this student because they were always late. And I realized later on when I thought about it, they were probably late because they weren't, that things weren't accessible. And of course the student ended up dropping out by the end of the second semester, by the end of the first semester or second semester. And the more I thought about this, I was like, this isn't the student's fault. This is how much is inaccessible here at my law school. And I had inaccessible things in law school. So I was denied any accommodation I applied for because you never seem to have enough documentation, even if you had a childhood diagnosis. And I know a lot of us talk about what a privilege that is, is that somehow it was never quite enough to have something from the age of three to the age of 20 because you didn't have something when you turned 21. And it was just a wild experience. And so you're knuckling your way through, you're fighting this systemic ableism that AJ mentioned as best you can. And at the same time, all your peers think you're getting any accommodation under the sun that's possible and that you have an unfair advantage while you're navigating law school trying to survive. So my law school experience is a little bit of that, that I was extremely privileged and grateful for the experiences that I've had while also having a deep criticism of how inaccessible law school and the legal profession as a whole is to disabled and neurodivergent students or prospective students or former students for that matter. When I got to practice, I think the most interesting thing is I had the opposite experience of so many that I know. I had found the best allies in practice to be parents of disabled and neurodivergent kids. Most of the people that I've worked for or have worked closely with or had good relationships with or with people who had personal experience somehow. Maybe it was rooted in wanting to do good. Maybe it was tokenism. Maybe it was just wanting to make the world a better place for their children down the line. Either way, I was extremely grateful for this because it meant that I was working with people who wanted to do the right thing. It meant that they were often granting me accommodations and different things that I didn't want or need, which was definitely interesting not having to advocate for myself constantly. It was a nice break from it, but it also meant that I was being stereotyped and pigeonholed in ways I didn't always feel comfortable with. I also realized for different reasons than AJ that disability rights law wasn't the thing that I wanted to do. I thought that was what I wanted to do at first. And I had the opposite problem. So I worked in it very briefly during one of my summer internships. And I realized I had felt too empathetic. And I know a lot of the times when we talk about autism and stereotypes, we talk about how people are just very apathetic. They don't care. I cared too much about the people whose cases I would work on and I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. I wouldn't have a work-life balance. I wouldn't have anything really because I'd just be concerned. I'd be thinking, oh my gosh, is this client who's getting evicted, is she sleeping at night? Is she having a seizure? Is she okay? And I'm still thinking about some of these folks years later. And that's not a healthy balance for me. So of course, I did the complete opposite when I did get to practice. And I went to go represent corporations and hospitals and whatnot because I don't care what they do after five o'clock, which was my take on it is, you know what? They're not. They're, I know that if you've gone to law school, you've already heard that corporations are people too. But they are not people the same way that a living, breathing human being is that you're worried about their health, their mental health, their well-being, their living situation, all sorts of other factors. So that was something I always thought about when it came to figure out what I wanted to do. And then I realized I was better suited to do advocacy and education. It's something I found a lot more enjoyable and that made more of an impact than representing hospital systems or doing some really cool anti-terrorism work that I really enjoyed as well. But there's so many different obstacles within practice, whether it's getting involved with your bar association, whether it's proving that you're competent to do the same work as others. It's just a very difficult system to navigate. And there's a reason that I always tell and point out to lawyers in particular why the rates of disclosure for lawyers with disabilities are historically as low as they are. And that doesn't even sort by different subtypes of disability or neurodiversity or anything, but historically our disclosure rates are much lower than the general population or anything else. And people always go wide. I'm like, do you want to unpack this? Because we could be here all day just talking about why lawyers with disabilities simply do not get the support they need, nor are they even disclosing, especially if they're going into private practice. Just a lot to unpack here, but I am extremely grateful to have a legal education to be able to 
approach things from a legal standpoint, but I understand how difficult that is and how much privilege it takes just to even survive that. This is Jalen. I I thought of this question before joining you all today, and (laughs) I think it still triggers the response of like, this is such a stressful question because I'm currently in the midst of trying to survive law school as a second year. And yeah, what AJ and Haley said is very accurate. I'm actually in the process of fighting for my accommodations now. And I resonate a lot to what Haley said too, because I've, I had accommodations, like I explained earlier throughout undergrad. And I guess I'm, I, I, yeah, I'm not a traditional student. Um, so my experience is probably niche as well, because I took a few years after undergrad to work in my background is in community organizing and activism. So I had a, quite a few years to do that. And then now I'm in law school, but as an evening student. So, you know, I work full time for a disability rights organization and part time. I do a lot of movement building around that intersection with voting and civic engagement. So balancing a job and a half while going to school. And it's really, um, and I don't want to sound negative, but I, I just want to be honest. It, it can be re- a really soul crushing experience, even <laughs> if you have all these resources, right? Like, you know, like Jalen, you work for a disability rights organization. Like, why don't you have accommodations? I'm like, yo, this is impossible. Like, I had these things, like, I can prove for the past, like, almost 10 years now, but no, it's outdated now. I don't believe you anymore. You have to go pay thousands of dollars to prove your disability. So it, it's a lot. It's a lot to juggle. It's a very demanding space. And it triggers flare-ups for me, honestly. But I stick with it because I don't... I'm 80% sure I don't really want to touch litigation. Everyone tells me to try it at least once. So I might, maybe, I don't know. But I really am here just to improve my advocacy, honestly, and be able to better understand these oppressive systems, like how legislation works, how policies work, how this bureaucracy works, just like how AJ was describing, because Honestly, I was just sick and tired of all the shenanigans going on in the world. And just as a grassroots organizer, I was really trying to figure out how to better sharpen my toolbox and strategies because the laws and policies were written without us in the room and also to oppress a lot of people. So just every day I grapple with that. Every day I'm in the classroom and having to debate our very existence to peers who have no stake and do not identify with any race or disability minority at all. Just saying really ableist and racist arguments. So there's a lot of angles where when you're coming into law school with this lens and these lived experiences and this advocacy and organizing experience, just it can be hard. The day-to-day of just arguing for my simple existence to just having access to actually survive the classroom. And I think Haley alluded to it too, but just why a lot of people don't even either give up trying to get accommodations because it's impossible or they don't want them because when it's time to take up the bar and people have discouraged me now, I don't think I will be the type that can survive without accommodations, which is why I'm even trying. But some people say don't do it because then they'll mark your record and then you won't be able to practice even if you pass the bar because you won't be healthy and fit enough to do this type of work. So there's a lot. It's a complicated space. It's a challenging space. But because I'm hard-headed and stubborn and want to advocate for people, I'm trying to just figure it out day by day. It just shows if they're trying this hard to keep us out, we must really be needed here. So (laughs) that's my unfiltered thoughts as someone who is currently stressed in law school, figuring it out. This is Maddie. I have so many thoughts listening to y'all talk about this and I'm like so fired up by y'all's investment in your advocacy and dedication towards disability justice and taking care of your community and truthfully until right now I've always this is just bringing my personal life into it as I identify with both disability and neurodiversity too. I'm like, what is on the horizon? I didn't even know you could go to law school without taking the bar. I'm like, I'm never doing that. And now y'all unlock something. (laughs) Y'all really unlock something. So stay tuned. But no, I really cherish everything that y'all 
just shared. And I think just like the value of doing things to better your advocacy and what y'all named as far as how you went to law school knowing you weren't going to practice law or went to law school thinking you're going to practice law and then decided not to or not do litigation, whatever it was. Like, I think talking about that is really important because I think when people think about law school, especially folks with disabilities, like Jalen, like you said, like the idea of going back to school for me and the amount of flare ups that I would have is just simply unimaginable. But again, there is that investment in the community of passing the baton and taking up that, I don't know, responsibility and and love for your community. And just the second thing that I was really sitting with is like how I'm so excited to make everybody within the NDRN, which is the National Disability Rights Network, (laughs) listen to this episode, because I think there's a lot of folks like like y'all talked about, even well-meaning people who get into disability law may not even recognize the the barriers that exist for students or folks within the law profession who have disabilities or experience neurodiversity in a way that wouldn't allow them accommodations or anything. So I think it's also like accountability for groups that do disability related law to make sure that they're not enforcing kind of the same stereotypes and barriers for folks interested in this work. Anyways, y'all really got me (laughs) fired up. (laughs) And I really, really appreciate everything that you shared. So much value in like that, that 10 minutes. Anyway, the whole episode. In in that vein, I like you said, and you named issues with accommodations, barriers. If you do want to practice law, to being on this blacklist of like people knowing that you have a disability if you use accommodations for the bar who even if you do pass you're known as not being quote unquote fit to do the job there's a lot of barriers and stigma that I think people are trying to assess maybe if they go into this work if you could give advice to yourself your younger self other young disabled and neurodivergent folks that are maybe interested in law or similar professions, what would you tell them and what encouragement or advice would you offer them? This is Haley. I'm happy to talk about this, especially because we brought up the bar and I took the bar exam and you brought up a really great point. And I know Jalen did too, about how the accommodations thing. So I only went against accommodations on the bar because I didn't have the history because my law school denied me. And I was like, great, I don't want to go through this and have to appeal this and then I'll never take the bar. And I also had it very deeply ingrained in me as you're taking the bar because you went through 30 years of this, you're finishing the job. So I do understand, especially now, something that's really strange that happens is people ask how many times it took me to pass the bar. And I say one, because it's true. I feel very fortunate. And then people try to invalidate that by asking if I got accommodations. And here's the funny thing about the bar. And this is the thing that I wish I had known from the beginning. Not everybody passes it right away. There are many reasons why. Because the bar doesn't really measure if you're going to be a good lawyer. It is something that was born out of sexism and racism and classism and all the things and essentially does not belong. So I have lots of feelings about the bar. And I wish I had known that going into it of, hey, this is not the thing that determines your worth. It is not the thing that determines whether or not you're going to be good and belong in this profession. I also want young prospective and current law students to know, especially, is there is a place in this profession or this industry for you somewhere. It does not have to be in litigation. It can be transactional. It could be in lobbying like AJ or community organizing like Jalen. There's so many great places. Or you can just be transactional and not have to interact with people all that much. There's so much great stuff that happens And the amount of doors and privilege that a law degree carries and opens is something that I'm extremely grateful for. Having gone into law school as a young person, I went in right when I turned 21. I have a very different take. And looking back, I wish I had been kinder to 21-year-old me. And it's very unfair that you were expected to advocate for yourself the way a lawyer will do when you are a student who is learning how to do and develop some of those advocacy skills. It's just presumed as a young disabled person, that you already have them, that you know how to fight every system, that you know how to advocate for yourself better than lawyers who've been practicing for longer than you've been alive have been doing. And you don't have to have all the answers. And it's okay if you don't have all the answers. 
And don't be afraid to find community. Like I said, I'm still very bitter in my own way, but also very grateful that things like the National Disabled Law Students Association did not exist when I was in law school. I wish it did because it would have been very nice to have some community. I feel lucky that the community and support that I had came from home. It came from my family, but I know that's not the case for everybody. So finding community when you're in law school or looking to do that is huge. And don't be afraid to ask the difficult questions of admissions departments and administrations of if they are doing anything for their disabled students, what they have available to them, how connected even they are to the undergraduate and other graduate programs and campuses in their work in disability rights and justice and disability resources. Because in my law school, it was separate from the undergrad campus. And that was big because the law school disability coordinator was not as well informed perhaps as the undergrad might have been. My undergraduate institution had a very robust disability resource center and programming while my law school did not in the same vein. So it's things that I wish we didn't have to ask these questions and we didn't have to think about it so thoroughly. But that's the advice that I would give. And just be kind to yourself because this stuff is hard. And it's not, I'm not saying that it's not hard for everybody because anyone who's gone to law school or is going to law school will tell you that it's its own brand of challenging and it will challenge you both personally, professionally, and as a human being. But for disabled and neurodivergent students, there's just those extra layers of challenges that hard is hard no matter what, but this is just, you are dealing with stuff that you shouldn't have to deal with. And please be kind to yourself in that process. This is AJ. I love going after Haley because Haley is so much more polished than me and it's it's a good balance. I would tell anyone to not be afraid to just completely shit up. I would tell myself that and do it even more and not care about the consequences. I know a lot of times in in the legal profession, especially students are, are threatened with professional consequences and you're going to have this on your record the administration is going to prevent you from getting admission to the bar, all these different types of things. And I would say not really that they hold these things over your head as if, as if they're the arbiters of who you get to be in your career and in your life. And it's simply not true. I, I think for me, it's been so empowering to realize that the more advocacy that I do and the more that I push against people, like even board of law examiners who aren't giving accommodations, calling them out, having meetings with them, writing advocacy letters and putting them on blast for the things that they're doing to students and test takers. Like the more you do that, the more people you will have reach out to you to say, thank you, to say, you have inspired me to do this, to build the movement, to push for a more equitable and accessible legal profession. I think a lot of times students, and it's totally okay, students are just like, I want to go to class, I want to get the best grade possible, and I want to get out and take the bar. And again, I would just say, you don't have to do it that way. It's not It's not required. It's not mandatory, obligatory. Those are the words I was looking for. Like, You can do your law school career and your professional career however you want, right? Just because most people don't do it that way or it hasn't been done that way or whatever doesn't mean that you can't do it and to not be afraid of that. I know a lot of people are afraid of not having the security of a job right when you graduate or having the best internship your 1L or 2L summer. And I think those that's completely legitimate. I would just like to be the voice that says it's okay if you don't do any of those things and you can do something amazing and fantastic and different and that's okay and, and you will almost always find support for what you do because there are other people who feel just like you and they they aren't represented and they don't have a voice or they don't feel seen or whatever other <laughs> body-centric analogy that I want to use, um, which is something I'm trying to work on myself. Uh, but yeah, I would say that. Don't be afraid to be different, to be unique, and to do it the way that you want to do it. Yeah, my brain's spinning because I was like, oh, what good advice I'm taking from um, these two as well. Um, this is Jalen speaking. I guess one would be like the same way where like Haley was saying that the bar doesn't indicate how great of a lawyer you'll be. I'll also say your grades. And I'll talk to people who are also perfectionistic like me because when sounds like grades aren't everything, I'm like, whatever, dude, I'm about to go get all A's. See, when you go to school, you're like, oh, this is unaccessible. This is... Go ahead, Haley. <laughs> Yeah, that was me as well. That you're like, yeah, it's not that important, but also I need to do exceptional, especially I think as students with disabilities, you have this kind of thing ingrained in you that you have to be exceptional no matter what and transcend it. So I feel that in my soul. Go on. 
Yes. So I'm speaking to the other professors. You, you really don't have to get all A's. Don't do that to yours. Because the thing is, I've had some classes where I tried to read everything and I got not an A. I won't put myself out there too much because I'm still a little bit of a perfectionist. But just the things I see people go through, the ways they really make their health deteriorate on purpose. It's just like, why don't you go to bed? What, Dude, why don't you eat? So don't do that. Like, it's not cute. Take care of yourself if you decide to go to law school. And like, honestly... Some grades that I got, you know, that were below an A. I, I've spoken to, through my job, you know, I've spoken to people who work in the Office of Civil Rights at some point in their lifetime, Department of Justice. And that's like a big federal agency. And I'm talking about all cases like, oh, so that's wow. You know a lot. I'm like, really? My grades don't look like I do, but I actually, maybe I did learn something. Great. AJ said, shit up. I agree. After undergrad, I was like, let me just absorb things and be an empath and be a healer and organizer in the movement. But this, I think it's okay if law school brings a different act, part of your activism out of you. People sometimes make it sick of me, but I think just coming in with this like critical perspective is so important because there's not that many of us who like openly identify and do work in this space, whether it's student groups or in classroom. I'm like, have we considered not making attendance this strict because people have like disabilities or emergencies? And just like some of the things I say, I don't even realize are radical, but they are. So I, to them, so I just lean into it to really try to make every space that I can as accessible as possible because I, my school has a disability law association, but even my school is just a few years old, which is still astonishing to me. I really thought it was a more national established thing. And I'm realizing how, no, it's so recent it is. So, yeah, you know, I would just say don't make grades everything. Really get what you want out of your experience. Really just keep your eyes on the prize. Do what you need to do, but don't be afraid to do advocacy where you can and have capacity to and other things I would say the Coelho Center for Disability Law they have a really dope fellowship that was starting when I was applying to school I I didn't have I didn't match up with that timeline perfectly but that's a really cool thing for people with who identify in a disability community to check out because that's like a pre-law pipeline program that's going to prepare you for a lot of stuff that we're talking about and give you sample classes to see if you want to participate in the shenanigans of law school at all in this career. Something that I wish I did better. I wish I applied for the law school. Like there's, it's the LSAT. It's like an examination you have to take to apply to law school. I wish I did that stuff like a year before I took that test. And I wish I started this law school accommodations process while I was doing my applications, which can be ridiculous because law school applications itself is already hard. But if you're already like considering it and just coming in, understanding that the bar is so much higher than I would say workplace accommodations and undergrad accommodations. So just making sure if you can try to budget time and money or scholarship money for that, just if you can, because I'm about to be halfway through my law school experience without accommodations and there's impacts to that. So just try to set yourself up to try to navigate, like just think about the challenges that we're speaking about to just try to figure out how you could put yourself in the best position possible to navigate those things and just literally get what you want out of that experience. Yes, yeah, I have, this is Keith, just a few thoughts based on some of the things you guys have said. I love the idea of how everyone just do this stuff at your own pace, do it the way it's best for you. And don't worry about what the societal norms or media or anything else says about what the experience of law school is supposed to be like. It's just, it, it's again, that's a stereotype and it's not what everyone goes through. And yeah, I love that the sort of a lot of the overall uh, thought here is just do what works for you, do what's best for you, take care of yourself and the things that they say are important aren't always what's really important. And I think that's really, that's powerful information. So leading through the thought process on this, as far as working with others, dealing with those professors and whatnot, when you're in school and you're dealing with their misconceptions, what are some of the elements of accessibility and inclusion that maybe some of these educators, other 
professionals you work with, people in this field are not thinking of that you really want to tell them about? You want them to know and not just know, but act on, put into use. This is AJ. I, <laughs> uh, Jalen's answer was so amazing, and I'm so glad they provided personal perspectives. I think in terms of educating other people, m- my thing is to tell people, like, it's not that serious. So I do space law. So I work in galaxy universe and we're all really insignificant and small things. I know we think we're like the most important people ever. And like the thing that we're working on is the most important thing that has to be done right now. But at the end of the day, we're just floating on a massive space rock really fast into infinity. And so like the concepts of professionalism. I don't believe in professionalism, but we'll talk about the people who do. Maybe you can relax those standards. Maybe you can relax your dress codes. I know we've talked about the bar a little bit. Virginia is a state that requires you to dress uh, in professional business attire to take the bar exam, which is just, I can't even comprehend that. Um, Obviously, like Haley said, it's classist, it's ableist, it's all those things, right? The only ism we support is autism. It's something that I just read. Anyway, it's not that serious, and we can allow for accommodations. We can allow for access and flexibility. Lots of people who do disability work have talked about this since the COVID pandemic began. Lots of people are really comfortable doing video calls, non-video calls, flexible attendance, and office out of office. There are lots of things that disabled folks have been begging for for decades like to the detriment of their employment to the exclusion of their participation in the workforce and now people are doing those things because it impacts able body minded folks right and so it's not that serious accommodations are okay it's not cheating right like you don't have to gatekeep everything i know lawyers attorneys people in the legal profession really do want to gatekeep because they feel special and people tell them they're special like oh you went to law school that's amazing you're so special oh you're an attorney that's amazing you're so special we're all just people it's not that serious if someone needs an accommodation or requests an accommodation or has an access need at least attempt to accommodate them before shutting it down a lot of times it's not that serious it's not that expensive the data is really old but it says you know under 500 dollars for most accommodations if you have to pay at all and allow people to be the kind of productive and fulfilling person that they are without as many barriers to prevent that so that they form or fit into the box of professionalism that has been erected to exclude so many people. I was processing, this is Jay, I was processing what AJ said and I just keep thinking, oh, I wish I, I was going to school with AJ because <laughs> it can be really, a lot of people don't think that way and it can be isolating at times, but really like it's not that serious. And I think just letting educators, faculty and staff, just to really be able to illuminate that to them is important because many times when I share those type of excessive like, perspe- perspectives, they say like, oh, well, we appreciate your radical compassion, but we have a standard to uphold or but this or that. And I just hope that people who are in who are who may have employees with this who are in the disability community, students, etc. This isn't about radical compassion. This is about basic accommodations. This is about civil and human rights to have access to a field of work that needs us and just Recognizing that this shouldn't be a radical thing. This culture should be normal. It should be accessible for people to have access to. So that's one thing I would say. And just making space, just having more space to unpack these barriers that are within the legal field structure itself, but also just intellectually have spaces in more groups and in the classroom as well. Because a lot of times, when people create these spaces, they promote neutrality uh, and freedom in speech, but it's often done in ways that could be very harmful to students in the room that aren't in the disability community or different races and backgrounds. So I would just say also being mindful and understanding that not every time we're going to feel comfortable being the one person in the room to defend the disability community, being the one person that and the room to defend Black civil rights it shouldn't be a burden on us every time. So just Sometimes ensuring that the space is having that critical analysis as well. So we're not emboldening people to who are also studying with us in the classroom to carry ableist and discriminatory and racist perspectives back out there in the world. Because the worst thing we need is more lawyers who 
interpret things that way. Those would be my th- my two big things. I have nothing that I feel like I can add other than this is Haley that doesn't just detract from the awesomeness of Jalen and AJ. So thank you both for just being you. Yeah, I'm I'm really just like sitting with such gratitude that y'all are one here talking with us and making the time to talk with us, but that y'all are really helping others just like literally anybody with or without disabilities, like everybody benefits from accessibility and accommodations and taking things less seriously, being more chill about professionalism, all of these things like this is really important work and I, yeah, I'm just sitting with a lot of gratitude that y'all are leading the way in, in these conversations and ensuring that this continues to become more accessible and become more well known so that law schools and hopefully the law profession writ large can think of disability in a better light and think of disabled lawyers in a better light. So yeah. Again, there's a lot of gratitude and I wanted to leave space if there's anything else that y'all wanted to mention. I appreciate Jalen, you highlighting the Coelho Law Center program. Were there any other resources or thoughts or anything that y'all would like to highlight? This is AJ. I think I'm obligated to talk about the National Disabled Law Students Association and the National Disabled Legal Professionals Association, which are there for folks who are looking for community, have questions, looking for help or advocacy or anything like that. They can reach out to to those folks on their different platforms, emails, website, all those things. This is Haley. I was going to plug all of AJ's stuff if he didn't do it. So thank you, AJ, for speaking out again. And keep in mind, depending on where you go to law school, your your university or school probably has a chapter of Endalsa. So that's exciting. Or you can go start one. Also, I am remiss if I don't plug my own stuff. So I am the author of Great Minds Think Differently, Neurodiversity for Lawyers and Other Professionals, with which was with the American Bar Association, which is super cool that they actually write, let me write, write a whole book about this stuff. So that is a little bit. And of course, I want to say that I am here to connect with folks as well as an ally, a colleague, a mentor, a friend, if that is something that's of interest. I know a lot of us are busy. I admit that I'm not great with my inbox, but I try to be here for other folks who are fighting the good fight. Yeah, I I would say for Black folks in the disability community to also seek out other intersectional resources as well. So the National HBC Pre-Law Conference, they're really great. Connects you with a lot of peers and mentors navigating the space. So I would just always want to pluck that. And just generally, there's so many different groups out there. Like just start to seek mentorship now to get advice and from people who identify with your culture, as well as maybe are in the disability community and the queer community. Just seek out as much voices and mentorship as you can to set yourself up in the best way possible. And just for listeners to know whether they're considering going to law or they're in law school or practicing now, just affirming that there should be nothing about us without us, as we always say, and that people can study disability rights and these issues for years, but we are experts. We are informed because we live this stuff every single day of our life. So please don't let anyone invalidate the fact that things that you're worthy and that you're deserving of a great career, a great education, just a great fulfilling life. So I just wanted people to be reminded of that because sometimes I need to be reminded of that too. Well, and thank you all for sharing your expertise with us and all of our listeners today. Really appreciate your time, your interest, your experiences and knowledge that you shared. Thanks so much. We really appreciate you guys being our our guests in the podcast today. This is AJ. Thank you so much for having us. I guess uh, Haley said folks could reach out to her. So I will also offer that. I guess I didn't before. Uh, Folks are welcome to find me wherever. Uh, And I guess also you should do space law because I think space law is cool and more people should do it. So I'll I'll plug that. This is Jalen. Feel free to reach out to me as well. And yeah, just thank you both so much for having us today. This conversation has been really motivating for me as well. And I hope for the audience it is too. 
This is Haley. And I just wanted to, again, thank you both for having us and thankful for having this platform with Disability Rights Florida and the work that we do as an organization. So just a note of gratitude. And of course, one last plug overall, just about disabled and neurodivergent joy, since I think so much of our experiences, we talk about the things that are difficult and the things that we've had to overcome and fight through. But I do want to have a quick last moment and end on a note of celebrating our joy. Thanks again to AJ, Jalen, and Haley for being on today's episode. Yes, thank you so much. And for those who are interested, they provided their contact information. So please feel free to contact them, connect with them, follow their social media accounts and ways that they shared. All of that will be listed in the show notes. Please keep up with all the great work they're doing, support their work and their investment in making legal advocacy, disability advocacy, all of these different spaces they're a part of. Please support their work they're doing because it is truly honestly like revolutionary and so formative to what's to come in the coming decades. Oh yeah, for sure. If you like what they said on the podcast, you're going to love all the stuff they say on social media and other various works that they put out and it's yeah, keep up with them that you'll be glad you did. So we will be back in two weeks with a very important episode with Dr. William Bronston and the national disability rights networks, executive director, Marlene Sayo on the history of Willowbrook and the future of disability rights work. Yeah, we have had this thing cooking, brewing, getting ready for you all for a couple months now. And we've put a lot of love and labor into that episode. And we really think every single person, no matter what your identities are, will have something to learn from that and learn this darker side of American history, disability history. If you think you know the Willowbrook story, you're going to realize you you don't really know the full story. It just really is like the the depth of the corruption, the depth of the violence at Willowbrook is just truly insidious. And there's like really no other way to spin it. And we'll definitely be giving a content warning before that episode and <laughs> sure. to make sure that everybody's safe while listening to it. But it's a really important listen and we hope you tune in. So with that being said, make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to this right now. So you'll get notifications about new episodes when they drop. We are on all of the podcast platforms, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Amazon. You can watch us on YouTube and more. You can also listen or read the transcript of each episode on our website at disabilityrightsflorida.org forward slash podcast. Yes, indeed. And thank you for listening. And as always... Please email any feedback, questions, or ideas about the show to podcast at disabilityrightsflorida.org. We'll see y'all in two weeks. The You First podcast is produced by Disability Rights Florida, a not-for-profit corporation working to protect and advance the rights of Floridians with disabilities through advocacy and education. If you or a family member has a disability and feel that your rights have been violated in any way, please contact Disability Rights Florida. You can learn more about the services we provide, explore a vast array of resources on a variety of disability-related topics, and complete an online intake on our website at disabilityrightsflorida.org. You can also call us at 1-800-342-0823. Thank you for listening to You First, the Disability Rights Florida podcast.